up an appropriate GI uniform and drive their much-prized wartime jeeps around the countryside with authentic flags flying. They did it yesterday. The manoeuvre yesterday was obviously special because they invited me along. All would be revealed on the King Harry Ferry, they said. A good place and in the right area to recall that hundreds of thousands of American troops came to Cornwall nearly 50 years ago in readiness for the D-Day embarkation. Well, as we clattered aboard the ferry, Simon Smith of Newland told me about his vehicle. Oh, well, this one actually came from a farm in Wiltshire. It was uh, laying on a farmyard, typical way people find jeeps. And um, I brought it back and it was restored over a two-year period. It's a 1944, probably built about the 12th of December 1944, by the chassis number on it. So it saw some action in the war? Uh, maybe just by the skin of its teeth, yes. It might have been brought over in, the, in early 45. They were moving things quite quickly in those days due to the Ardennes offensive. Pretty good condition. Where did the uh, name Jeep come from, do you know? Ah, well, a lot of people would like to know. I think it probably it was taken from a Pop the Popeye cartoon. He had an animal which he called Jeep, spelt exactly the same, which could do almost anything and go anywhere. I think that was why it was applied to the Jeep. They were certainly used for all sorts of things then? Yes, oh yes, yeah, that was used uh, for every conceivable purpose, mobile laundries and uh, cinemas, and they, they powered everything. The engines powered boats uh, and all sorts of things. How powerful is the engine? It's a uh, 60 brake horsepower, four-cylinder side valve, so it's quite an antiquated engine. It was basically the Willys uh, pre-war car engine, the 2200cc. So how valuable are they? I mean, how rare are they? They're not that rare as military vehicles go. They're the most common military vehicle because you know, they had so many useful purposes after the war and they were saved. But their actual value now is anywhere around, around the four and a half to five thousand pounds mark. And there were quite a few of them made? There were 640,000 built between 1941 and 45, yes. Goodness me, 640,000. And now they must exist, thinking of some of the fates of the troops which used them uh, at the bottom of the sea, perhaps, and under the sands of the desert. Yes, yes, there's, there's well-authenticated reports of, of them still crated up, laying on the decks of tankers at the bottom of the Bristol Channel. They're still there. So why are we sitting on a rainy afternoon on the King Harry Ferry in a jeep? Well, the man who can answer that is Mike Lyne. What's it all about, Mike? Well, the thing is, Chris, in two years' time, it's the 50th anniversary of D-Day. And we're expecting quite a few Americans, that's veterans, to return to this area to see where they left from on that historic, momentous occasion. And we are doing a recce with these World War II vehicles to see if we could get to some of the landing sites and embarkation places where they left from. I know we're two years ahead of our time, but we're trying to get things off the ground and get organised. So we're heading uh, at the moment for Tolvern Cottage, Smuggler's Cottage at Tolvern for one place, aren't we? Yes, that was a very, very busy place where they embarked in LCTs. Turnaway, that was another one. Ah, yes. Of course, the clues today, the uh, evidence we can see, are the concrete roads which still exist. Yes, and as we you walk down there, you will see the actual tank tracks still in the in the tarmac. Of course, Mike, I know you remember yourself the uh, the troops uh, being in Cornwall during the war. Yes, very vivid memories of it, Chris. When you think of the highways and byways jammed full of ammunition, uh, jerry cans by the thousand or by the hundred thousand, full of petrol beside the road, all waiting to go on the landing craft. I believe there was one road near Churro where it was all packed in. Yes, when you come off the A30 at Marins and Vos, as if you're going towards Truro, now that road running out to Allet was closed and it was jammed, packed full of ammunition from end to end. That was there till about the 4th of June and uh, on the 5th it was all loaded in craft and gone. Amazing. Now, you also remember them being in Bodmin, don't you? Yes, I was in Bodmin at, at that time. I lived there. And I can remember going to the barracks in early 44. Glenn Miller came down. And uh, I can actually say that I went to see him in the camp with all his band playing. There was Major Glenn Miller about 30 feet in front of me. I saw Eisenhower and Montgomery come out of Bodmin Railway Station. That was in 43, and Eisenhower was about 10 feet from me, and he turned around and said, good morning, lad. And I can remember saying good morning, sir. Well, of course, it's believed that Eisenhower came here to Smuggler's Cottage, where we're going when we get to the other side of the River Fowl in just a moment in this Jeep. We'll hear more about that tomorrow. So as we prepare to leave the ferry and roar up the hill on the other side, what sort of thrill does it give you owning a Jeep, Simon? 
Um, terrific. That's a nostalgia, I think, a lot of it. Of such a, a vehicle that's so well known and that's had, you know, has done so much, really. And we'll hear more tomorrow about my American patrol and indeed each day this week at 10 to 9. Did enjoy that run. Three minutes to nine is the time now. Not every day. Looking at those areas used by the Americans for their mass embarkation in June 1944. As we approach the anniversary of D-Day, they're preparing to welcome American veterans who undoubtedly want to be taken to places like Smuggler's Cottage at Tolburn on the Pound. So we rattled along the concrete road built nearly 50 years ago, and it was difficult to imagine how this tranquil, wooded setting must have buzzed to the movement of men and machinery. Pete Newman was the man to bring it all home to us. His parents owned the thatched smugglers' cottage then, and the pleasure boats they ran from there were used to help with the construction work. But why had this location been chosen to play such a significant part in Operation Overlord? Well, I think uh, the deep water was a great advantage, and of course the camouflage with all the trees. So the work began, and who did that work? Well, a company from London, which was called Harbour and General, and uh, the county council and a lot of local people. Big job. Oh, indeed, yes. Yes, we're talking about um, three months to build the road, as it were, I believe. Obviously, it was for my time, and uh, must appreciate that uh, this is only what I've heard from my parents and, and various people over the Nevertheless, years. Nevertheless, we're all standing on the evidence now. It must have been made rather well. Look at it all around us. Well, it was indeed, yes. This is all um, reinforced concrete. And recently we've gone on the mains electricity and to do that we had to dig up this road as you can see and um, it took the, the men who, d who dug it up uh, a lot longer because they realized that it was very tough. How thick is it? Well we're talking about eight inches this top surface uh, and then you go down and you've got wire mesh and then you've got hardcore under that. Of course it had to support some very heavy vehicles. Indeed yes. Yes Sherman tanks I believe and lorries, trucks whatever and of course thousands of troops. How extensive is the concrete way? It's also that road that we've come down to get here, isn't it? Yes, I say the road is about a uh, quarter of a mile long, and two-thirds of it was the existing road, which they widened, but the last piece, which is where you see those cars parked, was a field, and that was then dug out and pushed out here to where the flagpole is, which is all, all basically made ground, because prior to the war, the tide would come up right to where you're standing now, past the greenhouse. So this is all a hard which is actually made for the occasion. How long were the Americans here waiting to go? I'm not too sure about that. I would say um, a matter of weeks. But um, I know that they, they went on the 4th of, of June from here. They went on the 4th expecting to go on the 5th. And yes. It was postponed for, the, for weather, wasn't it? Yeah, well like you were, say, they were waiting on the, I think, on the landing craft. And, well, they were and in Palmer, weren't they, and around, yes. I, I believe, yes. So they were yeah. camped, what, in fields and on farms all the way around here? Yes, the majority of people, uh, the troops were under canvas. Um, here in the cottage, we had the high-ranking uh, officers that uh, lived there along with my parents. What a lovely place for them to set up HQ. Indeed, yes. They occupied the front half, uh, the, the room which is now our, our bar. There was 13 telephone lines in that, uh, in that particular room. And, of course, General Eisenhower was here to, to visit the troops. There are people that would dispute that, but um, my parents, in fact, saw, met, met him and saw him. And, you know, that, so that is, that's genuine. Well, that's good enough for me. Any of you boys want to ask anything more about the construction work here? What was left on the hard or in the surrounding fields after the invasion troops left? Well, there was a, a, the jetty was, was the most prominent thing, uh, which was removed. Uh, I've got some photographs of that. Do you remember that? I could, yes, I can, yes. It wasn't taken down until uh, the late 40s. It was a wooden construction, um, an RSJ, so uh, steel. But um, it was called a dolphin. There was, there was one here and two at Turnaware. How about equipment? Was there any equipment left in the field so that they took the lot with them when they went? No, there wasn't a, wasn't a great deal left, no. The only thing that I've discovered is when we were uh, preparing the barbecue, uh, we, we had the, uh, the digger in and cleaning it up, and uh, a lot of shells from the 40mm ag ag gun that was there. Quite a bit of uh, evidence of that. Uh, and quite a few stores left, in fact. I knew parents lived quite well after uh, the war for a while.
Four from Tolvern and Smuggler's Cottage at the same time tomorrow morning. Some fascinating stuff inside the cottage, I can promise you. It's now four minutes to nine. Into nine, now 29, let's go. In Jeeps belonging to the members of the Vintage Vehicle Trust, we went through the countryside on Sunday, checking out the various embarkation points used by troops in 1944 as they headed off to liberate Europe. In two years' time, we're expecting many surviving veterans to come over and follow our tracks to places like Smuggler's Cottage at Tolvern on the River Fell. It's believed Eisenhower himself, Eisenhower indeed, came there to brief his commandos before they departed. Pete Newman showed us some of his treasures with him. Now this is uh, something that was left, and um, this is an armchair, which we've had here all these years. As a you wooden can... chair, yes. Yes, as you see, made um, in 1943. The maker's name, which is uh, the chair company there from New York. Shouldn't you be proud of that? Well, yes. Uh, that's part of history, isn't it? <laughs> Perhaps Eisenhower himself sat on there. Well, you never know. Mother used to say it was in the room here, in, in the bar, so... Quite possibly. And, of course, discussing the, the plans for the invasion. Because that's the sort of thing that went on under these very beams in this cottage. That's it. A place with some secrecy, you see. There was obviously no landing or no, nobody was uh, able to get here. There was the troops manning the beach and uh, a sentry at the top of the road. You, you know, nobody could come in or out. And when my mother used to go out on occasion, she would have uh, two armed guards with her. Because she, she obviously knew quite a bit that was going on living here. But she wasn't allowed to wander around on her own. Now you've got some other interesting things over here. Yeah, this is a map of D-Day, which gives you the, the layout of Normandy and, and the beaches. This is the, the one that we're involved in, really, which was the American one. The Omaha, Omaha Beach. Beach. That's right, this is where most of the Americans... Landed. So you can imagine that they might have uh, sat here poring over a map like this. Indeed, this is where so. we're all going, boys. That's right. And this gives you a rough idea where they went from. It shows the Cornish coast. Foy's shown there as well. That's right. Foy and Dartmouth and Torquay working its way along right up as far as uh, Shoreham. And they've got the numbers involved here in D-Day. Of course, these are the men landed on the other side, 156,000. No. But I have got an interesting document, which is a copy of Operation Overlord. Now this says most secret in red on the outside. That's right. Yeah, this is issued from the records office of Her Majesty's stationary office. And notice it says in the uh, the front there, US secret equals British most secret. That, that's right, Chris. Yes. Pretty secret one Indeed, way or another. Yes. And as you can see, this is dated the 4th of March, 1944, giving you all the, the high-ranking officers and what vehicles and ships would be available for an invasion, which was... Um, coming up for June. And then you have a map here, I think. Yeah, this is the map that's in the back, which is of um, the Normandy coast, with all the German emplacements and, and what obstacles would be found on the various beaches. Top secret. Top secret. Until issued for briefing ground troops, thereafter, secret. <laughs> you must uh, feel pretty proud of that one. That's it, and I've got this visitor's book, which is the American that came here and signed it for us. As you can see, he says, I departed from this harbour on the 4th of June, 1944, and landed at Omaha Beach on D-Day, 6th of June, 1944. And he came to see us in 1977. And that was Philip C. Bowers. Yes, and he was from the, the 5th Corps Army. Do you have anything else here of interest to the period? Well, you can see some photographs. This is a, a photograph of Eisenhower, which was sent to me by Eisenhower's son. And this is the script which was given to all the troops by uh, Eisenhower, the Supreme Commander. Ah, yes, Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force. Soldiers, sailors and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you go on, you're about to embark upon the Great Crusade, towards which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. Goes on to say, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We'll accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck. This is where you do your, your barbecuing in the evenings, obviously. What have you got here? Well, this is uh, part of a box, Chris, that we discovered. As you can see, the writing uh, quite prominent on it. U.S. Army Field Rations, Type C. Eight cans of meat and beans. Eight cans of meat and vegetable stew. Eight cans of meat and vegetable hash. And <laughs> 24 cans of bread. 
They didn't live too badly. That might have been the sort of uh, ration they were carrying with them, I suppose, to D-Day. Yes, I've, I've um, heard Mother say that uh, they never went short of anything. But they left that one behind. That's right. Contents long gone. Pete Newman of Smuggler's Cottage. There'll be more about the Americans in Cornwall tomorrow morning at 10 to 9. In the combat conditions, this is what you would see men walking about. You might have seen them walking down the high street in Falmouth like that. They had many dresses. Sometimes you would see them in their uh, four pocket tunics, ties, polished shoes, and other times you would see them in this equipment. Do you think they were a rowdy lot? I believe some were, yeah. They were obviously frightened and didn't know what to expect, so they, I suppose some had a few drinks, and uh, I suppose some were quite normal sort of quiet people. There is one incident uh, at Lawson, I believe, where there was a, a mass fight between, I think there's over a hundred fighting sort of racial between the uh, black Americans and the white Americans. In fact, I believe a few were killed. More tomorrow morning from the Vintage Vehicle Trust as we move on to Tolvern and further down the river fowl, looking at evidence of the Americans in Cornwall. It is five to nine. You're tuned to BBC Radio Call. How about this? An auction's being held at Sotheby's today. Yes, back in the Jeeps today and heading for another of the areas where Americans change the landscape of Cornwall. Turnaway Point on the River Fowl is just opposite Trelissic House. It's densely wooded just there. The perfect place to conceal large numbers of troops waiting to embark on Operation Overlord. We drove as far as we could down the military road, then walked the last quarter of a mile to the water's edge. George Brinkley of St. Cullum is a member of the Military Vehicle Trust. He was my companion as we walked downhill. Well, we're walking down the concrete. You can still see the evidence of this, uh, this concrete, although it's grown over very much on the sides, hasn't it? It has, and it looks as if it was a great deal wider at the time when uh, it was actually in use and doing the purpose for which it had been built. Tank tracks? Could be tank tracks, yes, down beneath us here. Quite something to think that uh, all those military vehicles, the tanks and so on, came down this very road to go over on such a dangerous mission. Yes, that's very true. And uh, the other thing which I think that we should bear in mind is that a great deal of the men, the personnel involved, uh, it was just unfortunately a one-way trip because many of them uh, are left behind over there in France and Germany and uh, they came over here, particularly the Americans of course, to help us fight a war and win a war. It was um, a time of extreme strife. We hadn't had the Battle of El Alamein at that time. We'd only had Dunkirk and various other tremendous wartime losses and defeats and uh, I suppose they brought a, an injection of optimism that we uh, looked upon them as our allies and uh, they brought with them the old slogan that we all now well remember. Oversexed, overpaid and over here. And there was another one which was not too widely uh, spoken of or known of, but they used to say that they left their stature behind but they brought their liberty with them. But uh, of course they quickly responded with their own slogan, which was uh, directed at the British soldier. And that was, he was underfed, underpaid, undersexed, and under Eisenhower. <laughs> uh, but that quickly dissipated, and within just a very sh few short months, the American soldier over here, and bear in mind that in the build-up to the invasion in 1944, there was somewhere in the region of two million American GIs in this country and they were accepted in many homes they had adopted mothers and fathers and that when the invasion actually did start and the cities and towns and villages quickly emptied there was a great deal of uh, sadness at the going of the the yanks quite an impact then on small communities thousands of them were in cornwall they brought their stockings as well didn't they <laughs> well they did yes they did and uh, of course they were the envy again of the the british servicemen regarding uh, one important factor they had everything that there was needed to be had uh, and the money that they were receiving 
was adequate to be able to purchase most things. And of course then, they attracted the girls. Well now, if I can interrupt, you've just come down now to a, a clearing, an opening out where the, uh, the concrete road spreads away to the right as well as to the left. Clearly we've arrived down by the riverside. This was another of the embarkation points. Yes, I would imagine that as and when the final details for the actual invasion had been reached and the staging areas had been made, the troops were then brought down from various areas and they were scattered right up into the Midlands. They also uh, had to be transported down. This area probably would have been a closed area, no communication with the outside world. They were sealed in and they were then waiting their orders. Uh, that probably would have all taken space of time in around about five or seven days to transport huge amounts of uh, equipment, vast amounts of men and material, as well as the, the vehicles that were needed for the invasion. That was George Brinkley of St. Cullen. Thank you for all your interest in this particular series. I have many letters, and I'll be fitting some of the comments in during the course of next week. Next week, my feature at this time looks at oysters. Should slip down a treat, I'd say. It's just after five to nine now as we head for Penzance.